They're watching what's going on because the testimony and the witness was taking place even from the very first day of, of giving our heart and our life to Jesus. Now for some, this was part of their journey. You know that Jesus wasn't baptized until he was 30 years old. That means that there were a lot of years where a very qualified, capable, sold out young man was walking, doing the right things according to the scripture, and yet the beginning of his baptism or his baptism began his ministry, his public ministry. It was after that that we saw what was recorded as the first miracle at Cana in Galilee in John chapter 2. Throughout the Bible, God has revealed himself. And yet, even though God's revealed himself throughout the Bible, we don't know where he came from. We don't know uh, where he began or or. Uh, if, he, if he had any other details other than the little window that we have in the Word, we don't know what he looks like. We actually don't know what he knows. He is beyond our capability with our finite minds of understanding things. So the details about God in the Scripture is that, that we know very, very little, and yet we know that the creative aspects of God and the relationships that he's had with mankind means that he, through the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, was here from the beginning and before. And that he has chosen to relate to us. He wanted a family so bad that he created mankind to be his family. The angels weren't capable of that. and He created individuals who, like him, could make choices. And he wouldn't have given us opportunity for choice had he not allowed Satan to be a part of this world. The bad things that happen in this world are not from God. The bad things that happen in this world are because we live in a sinful, fallen world. Death is a result of the sin. It was not part of God's eternal design for mankind, but it was part of God's plan because he knew that sin would separate us from him. And if we chose through the gift of salvation to come back to him, then we could have a relationship with him that would then never end. So he, he loved us so much that he gave his son that we could have eternal eternal life. So then the Bible, if we look at the Bible itself, is a book full of history. But it's not history about the details of God. It's literally a history about the relationship of God with his creation, which is mankind in this world. So from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's all about people. Have you ever thought about that? Sometimes we think that the Bible is something that is, that is uh, something that we can't relate to. We actually can relate to it from the beginning to the end because it's about God relating with people in, in, throughout his word. In the scripture it says that we can trust God and we can trust his word and he will be faithful to his word. He will do what he says and he will do those very things. So much so that when he made a vow with Paul, Paul believed it. Now Paul had gone to this city. We talked a lot about the city last week. That'll be on YouTube in the next week or so. But the details of the city that Paul, and I, I really appreciate um, what Clayton is doing and in, in getting all of our, our sermons and, and songs and those kind of things caught up through our YouTube videos so that you can go to those and, and hear that in a timely manner. He's done a lot of work and a great job with that. Uh, one night, Paul, in the middle of this sinful city of, of I start to say Corsicana, it was Corinth. I knew it started with this C. In the middle of this sinful city of Corinth, uh, was thinking, I can't go through this again. I don't want to be uh, beaten again. I don't want to be flogged again. I don't want to be thrown into prison again. I don't want to be starved again. I don't want to be stoned again. And, and he said, I don't know that I can go through this again. And God said, Paul, I'm going to be with you. Stay the course in, in Corinth. Stay the course. Don't stop preaching the word. Do not stop speaking the gospel of Jesus Christ. Continue because I am with you and I will protect you through it. God said that, the Lord said that, in the verses just prior to the verses that we're going to look at today. We're starting in verse 12, but verse 9 is where God said, Don't be afraid, keep on speaking, I'm with you. No one is going to attack you or harm you because I have many people in this city. Now one of those people in the city who was not a child of God, probably, at least not at the time, was a man named Gallio. He was the, uh, the judge or the 
governor. The scripture calls him a proconsul. He was the one who was in the ruler role since about AD 53, which is within this time frame. The ancient writers talk about him as being remarkably or amazingly calm. His own brother, a historian named Seneca, wrote these words about him. He said about Gallio, he said, No mortal was ever so mild to anyone as my brother Gallio. He was to everyone this way, and in him there was such a natural power of goodness. It's like something that was a gift of his, a gift of compassion possibly. And yet Rome saw that his ability to make judgments was so strong that they put him in charge of all of Achaia, which was Greece, and Cor um, Corinth was the capital of Achaia. And so he was sitting in the capital city of this area of Greece, which was quite broad, and all individuals were brought before him. He had a position of judgment called a judgment seat that the scripture used likened to the judgment seat that Christ is going to be seated on one day. 2 Corinthians 5.10 uses the same word, the bema or the bema seat judgment. And this judgment seat of which uh, this man Gallio and Jesus would have one day is a place where accountability is handed out but also blessings are handed out because of the nature of this man. So, in verse 12, we see this man Gallio, and, and you'll see why this was one of the individuals that God said, I have many people in this city. Apparently, Gallio was a man who was a God-fearer, a man who wanted to do right, and a man who always balanced things in judgment. He would be a great, great, wonderful Supreme Court justice because he just did the right thing under God. Verse 12 says, While Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, Corinth being the capital, the Jews of Corinth made a united attack against Paul. Now God said, I'll protect you, but the Jews said, we're going to get rid of this guy. They brought him to the place of judgment, this Bema seat, this Bema seat. And Paul had to think, well, here I go again. I'm about to go through those beatings. I'm about to go through those stonings. I'm about to go through prison again. They may crucify me like they did the Lord. These same types of mindset of Jews these Jewish leaders were the ones that crucified Christ. Not the same individuals, but ones with the same mindset. They said, before Gallio, they said, now there was apparently a lot of people in there by this time. There were a lot of Corinthians in there, which meant Grecian or Greece people. There were probably a number of Jews also. I don't know if Paul was in there or not, but they said this man, which indicates he probably was, this man they charged is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. And Paul had to go, I'm about to, I'm about to get beat up again. Just as Paul was about to speak, Gallio said to them, Gallio. Now Paul was going to give his uh, rebuttal of the things that were going on. And Gallio said, hold on. If you Jews were making a complaint about some misdemeanor or serious crime, in other words, if you had something that was actually against the law under Rome, then I would address it. It would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involves questions about your words and names, who is, who's in charge, who's the Son of God, who's the Messiah, and your own law, like, like in your, it'd be like us having rules in our church and then us going to uh, one of the judges in Ennis or in the area and say, hey, we need you to, to, uh, to rule on uh, law to say who's in charge of the donuts in the kitchen. And they'd say, we don't care who's in charge. No one has broken the law. But so-and-so is mean about it and so-and-so is happy about it and so-and-so is happy. Get out, get out, get out, he said. So he drove them out. He said, since it involves questions about your words and names and your own law, settle the matter yourselves. I will not be the judge of such things, trivial stuff. And he drove them out. Get out of my courtroom. And then Paul probably remembered the promise. Don't be afraid, Paul. Be bold about the gospel. Say and preach the name of Jesus, for I am with you. I will protect you. No one will do you harm, because I have people in this city. And Paul might have looked over his shoulder and went... Gallio. God has his hand in Gallio's life. 
Well, he was heading out. It was good news for Paul, but it was bad news for somebody. You see, there was probably some, some tension that was going on between the people of Corinth and the Jews because that happened. It happened in Rome and they were all kicked out of Rome and they ended up in Corinth and now you've got Jewish people in Corinth and you've got the, content, you got the tension between the, the Romans and the Jews. And on top of that, you've got this man, Paul, who had been preaching in the synagogue. In fact, in the very synagogue uh, that was bringing charges against him, the former synagogue ruler, leader, which was named Crispus. Remember we talked about him last week, how I said Merry Crispus because he got so happy about the Lord. He, this man Crispus believed on the Lord, he and the rest of his family, and they came forward. They were standing on behalf of Paul probably. Other people from Corinth, the scripture says in verses 8 and 9, believed and were baptized. There were a lot of people who were starting to come on for Jesus Christ, and now these Jews wanted to put Paul in jail or to find him in contempt somehow so the charges would be brought about him. So the, everybody was a little bit, I mean, the tension was high. There were people who were probably Christians there. There were people who were Greeks there. All these Gentiles and Corinthians, some Jews who were even saved individuals. And then you've got these people who are trying to attack someone that they loved already. And this was the man Paul. Now here's what was taking place. There was a religious leader there from the synagogue, the new leader taking Christmas place, named Sosthenes. And Sosthenes was the, I know he has a humorous name, doesn't he? he has, Sosthenes was a man who was, who was now in charge of the Jews, which meant he was the symbolic head of the Jews of the synagogue there. And these Corinthian Christians and these Corinthian Grecian individuals said, somebody's going to pay a price for this blasphemy that took place in this court. And right there in front of Gallio, who was this calm-mannered guy, they started, bam, 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 they started beating Sosthenes. They just started beating him up. I mean, somebody's, we're, we're riled and somebody's going to pay the price. Paul was just walking out and Gallio was looking at this. And they just start beating him. And the scripture says, the crowd there in verse Verse 17 turned on Sosthenes and the synagogue, the synagogue leader. You know, we trusted you, possibly, they said. They beat him in front of the proconsul who was Galileo, Galileo and Galileo showed no concern, whatever. Gallio's watching them beat this man up. He might have gotten up from his little beam of seat judgment and walked out into the hall to the candy machine, got him a Pepsi and one of those Snickers, walked back there, watched that, and just drank that Pepsi and ate his Snickers bar. There was something going on that said, and the scripture recorded, he didn't care. Or maybe he said, this is something that is not mine to step into. There was something going on, and it's larger than what I just made fun of there. But we know that Sosthenes also was affected for Jesus Christ. They didn't kill him that day. They didn't kill Sosthenes, though they probably could have. They just beat him up real good. But something changed in Sosthenes. And it doesn't say it right here. But when we read, as Paul wrote back to this church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1 through 3, it says, Paul called to be an apostle. Apostle. Paul is writing to this church at Corinth, and he said, I, Paul, called to be a, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and by the will of our brother Sosthenes. He apparently remained in that position. He apparently at least remained in, in a position of respect. And after this, somehow, somehow there was a change in Sosthenes' heart. He didn't want to bring charges against Paul. Instead, he said, I present Paul to you as an apostle of Jesus Christ. I think it's probable that the reason for that is that after Sosthenes was beaten, Paul went, I do have a protection over me. God is true to his word. And this man took my beating. He might have met him outside and said, hey, you want to come over to Priscilla and Aquila's house? They are so nice. They let me live with them and I work with them and, and you need some ministering too. And he got out band-aids and stuff like that and took care of them. I don't know what exactly took place, but we know that Sosthenes became a believer in Jesus Christ so much so that he not only condoned, but he published the fact that Paul was an apostle of Christ. So verse 18 says, Paul stayed in Corinth, continued in Corinth for some time. Uh, verse 11 told us earlier that he was going to be there uh, for one and a half years. Then Paul left. 
He left the brothers and sisters and he sailed for Syria. And he was accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. Remember, Priscilla and Aquila had fled from Rome. They started a business, a tent making business in Corinth. And as they started this tent making business in, in Corinth, God had placed them there for when Paul got there, he told them about Jesus. They said, we believe this Christ. We believe that he rose from the dead. We believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And when they put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, they opened their home to Paul. They became a mission center for a year and a half. And Paul worked with them until he got some funds from Philippi probably. And then he just went full time into ministry there. So when he said, I'm going to head away, I'm going to head on down to Ephesus. Paul was told not to go to Ephesus before. This is just for those of you who have a good memory or your studiers. Remember he was told, uh, skirt, go above the churches of Asia Minor. Don't go down to Turkey. Don't go down to Asia Minor. Instead, go straight over to Macedonia. But this time when he was in Corinth, God said, go down there and start some churches in Turkey. Start some churches down there in Asia Minor. And the seven churches that are found in Revelation 2 and 3, including Ephesus, are churches that were started during this time. Paul headed down to Ephesus. Now, Priscilla and Aquila, you know, if you remember last Sunday, it mentioned Aquila first, which is the man, and Priscilla, which is the woman, but they switched the names for the rest of the times in this book, in Corinthians, in Timothy, and the other places where you hear about Priscilla and Aquila, they use her name first. And why was that? Same reason that people say Carol and Michael, because she's the spiritual giant, and I'm the one that kind of falls under the purse strings. The fact is that Priscilla must have been a godly woman. She must have been a woman that that so many people had such respect for or maybe it was just easier to say Priscilla and Aquila because they couldn't think of Aquila's name because it was so goofy. We don't know but anyway they wrote those things down. Now Paul is about to sail and they said we want to go with you and so they're getting all their knives and, and uh, sewing things because they were those tent makers. They were getting all of the tools that they had, tools of the trade and they are going now Priscilla and Aquila down with Paul. And God used them because God was going to use them to plant a church and to water the church that was going to take place in Ephesus. Now, I'm telling you all of these things for a reason. And I know this sounds very historical and just informational, but there's a reason. It's because people are important to God. Remember that. That's where we started. That's where we're going to wind up in a moment. In a moment. Before Paul sailed, he had his hair cut off at Centria because of a vow he had taken. They don't tell us what the vow is. I believe that it's real probable that the vow had to do with that time that God said, no one will harm you. And because this was a unique, the Lord coming to him and saying, uh, nobody's going to harm you, keep preaching the word. And Paul probably made a vow to God, I will. And when they made a vow to God, then they often did something like saying, I will not cut my hair. That was vows that were brought from the old covenant and this was a vow that Paul made at the end of his Corinthian mission journey after a year and a half he cut his hair I should have stopped cutting my hair 11 years ago I would look more like the guys on Duck Dynasty now Paul probably looked just like a duck commander he probably had a long beard because that was part of his hair he probably had long hair on his head and maybe under his arms I don't know where he had it but I know that he didn't cut his hair until now and he said hey I heard of a good bar in Centria. My vow is complete and they can't hurt me anymore because I'm leaving Corinth. And he left this place and he went to Centria. He got his hair cut. Now it doesn't tell us any more about that. It says that they, which was Priscilla and Aquila, arrived at Ephesus. We're at this, we're at this dip down area. The churches of Asia Minor. We're at Turkey. We're in, we're in Asia, the, the lower part of Asia. And now this, they come to this town called Ephesus. And then it says Paul left Priscilla and Aquila there. But while he was there, he himself went into the synagogue and he reasoned with the Jews. Come, let's reason. Let's talk. Reasoning together means that there's some give and take on both sides. I got to recognize where you are and I want to help bring you to where God needs you to be. Paul was equipped with that and he reasoned with those Jews. He was a consistent glutton for punishment going to the synagogue. This is the place that he got beaten. This is the place where he, he faced persecution over and over and over again and he said, I'm going to go there anyway. And he did go there. Thank you.
Um, Clayton, if you could go ahead and shut that light off on the camera up there, just because it's a little bit of a distraction to me. We have 80 million lights in here, and there's one that was a distraction. When they asked Paul in Ephesus, by the way, and they didn't beat him, they didn't, they didn't kick him out, but when they asked Paul to spend more time with them, he said, no, i got to go. I'd like to stay, but I have to go. He planted the church. He planted another church. There's something important about that. I'll tell you why in a minute, because he was leaving Priscilla and Aquila behind. He, they said, stay with us longer, teach us. He said, no, I can't, but I am going to leave Priscilla and Aquila with you. And as he left, he promised, I will come back if it's God's will. And he set sail from Ephesus. When he landed at Caesarea, he went up to Jerusalem and he greeted the church. Checking in with the, the main church that was in Jerusalem... Remember, Jesus said the message of the gospel will go out first at Jerusalem, then at Judea, then some area, and then to the uttermost parts of the earth. And it did do that, and, and the message was going out. So he stopped there and greeted the church, and then he went down to his home church, the church that sent him out as a missionary, and that was the church at Antioch. Antioch uh, was north, but geographically, it was, or elevation-wise, it was down. They always said, we're going up to Jerusalem, even if it was south. They always said, we're going up to Jerusalem. It was a picture of things that are yet to come as we get to go to the new Jerusalem one day. After spending some time at his home church in Antioch, Paul set out from there and he traveled from place to place. This was the beginning of his third missionary journey, set out from Antioch. We're not going to go into details of that. But he says he traveled through the region of Galatia and Phrygia. He was strengthening all of the disciples there. Paul knew that it was important for him to go back, to encourage, to strengthen them, to say, press on, because it's worth the journey. Meanwhile, and this is another individual that we need to recognize today, there was a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria. Now, Alexandria was a city of higher learning, not necessarily like philosophies or philosophers that Athens had, but it was a place with, with universities and it was a place where people would go to study. Alexandria was known for that. They had a lot of doctors. They had a lot of people with doctorates and master's degrees and those kind of things. Folks of higher learning and Apollos was one of those. He apparently was a uh, strong intellectual guy. He was a great debater. He was an individual who could, who could stand his ground if he knew the material. Guess what? He knew the material. Now the New Testament material hadn't been written, but what he knew was the Old Testament. He knew this part of the Bible and he knew it well. He did not know Jesus personally as Savior, but he knew that there was a Messiah yet to come because he had been baptized, repented, into the repentance of John the Baptist who said, you prepare your heart for a Messiah to come. And he baptized individuals who were cleaning their heart, preparing their heart for the Messiah to come. But he never had met Jesus. Here's what it says about him. He was a learned man in verse 24, and he had a thorough knowledge of the Scriptures. And the Scriptures were the Old Testament. The books of the law, the books of the prophets of that day, the books of Moses, the Pentateuch. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord and he spoke with great fervor. He was, he was such a powerful speaker that many people were swayed by his words. And he taught about Jesus accurately. Now why could he teach about Jesus accurately? Because if you look in the Old Testament, you can teach about Jesus without even knowing the New Testament. Because Jesus is the bloodline of Christ goes from Genesis all the way through Malachi. It goes all the way through the Old Testament. He knew the Messiah. He he knew that the Messiah was coming. He knew that the Messiah, he knew the details of those things, but there was something he was missing. It wasn't the intellectual part. He was missing the relational part. He was intellectually accurate, but he had never been baptized into Jesus. Now, the Jews, who Apollos was one, were required to be baptized into Jesus. Apollos was a child of God. He was a child of God under the Old Covenant still. The Old Covenant had not gone away yet, though the Old Covenant had become obsolete, which meant it was not effective for anyone new to come under the Old Covenant, but there were still some who were covered under the Old Covenant who had not died yet. 
There's a passage in Hebrews chapter 8 verse 13 that's talking about Christ and it says, By calling this covenant new, he made the first one obsolete. That took place the very night that Jesus died on the cross and the veil of the temple was torn from the top to the bottom and no more was there a holy place on the earth, but we could go directly to the Father through the Son of Jesus Christ. But what if you had always gone to hear from God from the outside in under the old covenant and you never realized that you could approach the throne of grace You could approach the throne of God through the blood of Jesus Christ. That was Apollos. That verse in Hebrews 8.13 says, By calling this covenant new, he made the first one obsolete. And then it says about Apollos, And what is obsolete and aging will soon disappear, because the old covenant had not gone away yet. And Apollos was one of those individuals. So you understand that he was looking forward to the Messiah, and he was a child of God. Now, in Acts 2.38, Jesus, uh, Paul, I'm sorry, in Acts 2.38, Peter was preaching to the Jewish people, like Apollos, who was not there. He was over in Corinth somewhere. But he was preaching to the Jewish people, and he said, Believe on the Lord Jesus, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's important. Let me camp on that for just a second. They who were children of God, called children of God, by God himself, had God the Father as Father, the Father uh, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were under that covenant, but they didn't have a relationship with Jesus. So when the Holy Spirit figuratively or literally left the temple, they had no link to God. They were the people who followed the Holy Spirit through the wilderness as a pillar of cloud by day and fire by night. They heard from and saw from the Holy Spirit throughout their lives they heard of those things. But they never had a personal relationship and their bodies were never the temple of the Holy Spirit. Only the king or the leader had a spirit of leadership that God gave to them, but their bodies weren't the temple of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit dwelt in the temple. Now, Paul said, Peter said, if you will believe on the Lord Jesus... The one that you're missing, you had the Father and you had the Spirit, but you're waiting on the Son. If you'll believe on Jesus Christ, if you will identify through baptism with his death and his burial and his resurrection, then the Holy Spirit will come into you. And their bodies became the temple of the Holy Spirit. From the rest of the time after this in Acts, when someone who was not a Jew, just a Gentile, um, Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 7, or Acts chapter 8, 10, 16, individuals who accepted Christ then, the Holy Spirit came into them immediately and they were baptized later. But here for the Jews who were already children of God, they had to identify with Jesus before the Holy Spirit would come into them. Which, what I'm saying this, the reason I'm saying this is because Apollo had great intellect, but he did not have guidance of the Holy Spirit. He didn't have conviction of the Holy Spirit. He didn't have the wisdom or the knowledge of the Holy Spirit because he had not believed in the one that completed the picture, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so he was teaching with great wisdom, just like they would have through the whole Old Covenant. Verse 26 says, when he, Apollo, began to speak boldly in the synagogue, there were two new people there. It was Priscilla and Aquila. And they were listening to this man with great wisdom or great insight, great intellect, but he was lacking the wisdom of the Spirit. So when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and they explained to him the way of God more adequately, perfectly, or more correctly. This was Priscilla and Aquila. They didn't stand up and go... Dude, you sound like somebody who knows a whole lot. But have you ever placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? Because he said he's the way, the truth, and the life. No one will come to the Father except by him. Are you missing this, Apollo? They didn't do this. They didn't say this publicly. What they did was afterwards, like I hope y'all do. No, you can do it however you want. But they came up to him afterwards and said, Apollos. You are a great, learned, wise man with great intellect. But we want to tell you about a relationship we have with the one that you've been talking about, the Messiah. We've met him. We know him. He guides us. He walks with us. Like that video I shared weeks ago. It's, it's now, it's like Jesus before me, Jesus behind me, Jesus on every side. He is my guide through life and I don't step off the path because it's within the path that I'm protected. And he protects me. He walks with me and he talks with me. And then they sang some other hymns to him. Maybe, I don't know what they did. And he tells me I am his own. They took him aside 
invited him to their new home in this town of Ephesus, and they shared with him the personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I think there's a lot of people in this uh, United States that we live in that have a great intellect and they know that Jesus is the Son of God. They have heard of the Messiah. They know that God created the earth. Uh, many of them haven't heard that, but many have. And they have this intellectual knowledge, but they're lacking a relationship. They have not said, just as I am, I come. I give to you, God. Walk with me. They have not said publicly, I have decided to follow Jesus. And you might be one of those individuals who, who is just lacking one thing. And that's the relationship. You've got all of the answers already. Verse 27, it says, when Apollos... Now, um, after he heard the word more adequately, and that word does not completely uh, share what took place, Apollos obviously said, I am all in. I want to know the rest of the story. And, and Apollos probably had the details so clear that he could walk through Isaiah. He could walk through the Psalms. He could walk through those details in Psalm 22, 23, and 24 about Jesus, what took place on the cross in, in 22, what took place in the the life of him and what is taking place now. He could have walked through all those details and they said, Jesus fulfilled that. Jesus fulfilled that. Jesus fulfilled that. They could have gone through, they literally could have gone through 600 details of, of prophecies of Christ and every one of them that Apollos would have known, they could have said, Jesus fulfilled that. And here's where it happened and here's when it happened. He fulfilled that. Apollos believed. The scripture says in verse 27, when Apollos then wanted to go to Achaia, Corinth being the capital of this place, Apollos going from Ephesus now to Corinth. I think I said he was in Corinth before. I was wrong about that. He was in Ephesus and he went now to Corinth because that's where his mission was going to be. When he wanted to go to Achaia, to the capital of Achaia, the region of Greece where Paul and Aquila had come from, the brothers and sisters who were Christians, who were Christian brothers and sisters, encouraged him. They even wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. Many denominations have a letter that is sent. If you go to another church, then they'll say, uh, can you send my letter of recommendation to this new church to let them know that I'm in good standing and blah, blah, blah. And so many denominations will have uh, a church write a letter. We've done this for individuals that wanted a, a letter of affirmation to go to their new home, to their new church. And we write those down and, and let them know what they're doing for Christ. Uh, this is what took place here with Apollos as he went forward. The Christians in Ephesus sent him ahead. When he arrived, it says he was great help to those who by grace had believed. For he vigorously, he vigorously, remember how intellectually strong he was? He vigorously refuted his Jewish opponents. It says his opponents because he was Jew. He refuted his Jewish opponents in public debate, proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. Remember, he had the capability. He had the capability to go through the details and say, this was fulfilled by Christ. This was fulfilled by Christ. This was fulfilled by Christ. Jesus is the Messiah. When later Paul wrote to Corinth in 1 Corinthians, he said, some of you in Cor Corinth are following Paul so strongly. And this is important that I read this, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 4 through 9, the letter that Paul wrote to Corinth where Apollos was now serving, he said, why are you quoting? Quarreling. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another says, I follow Apollos. Oh, I'm, a, I'm a disciple of Paul's. I'm a disciple of Apollos. Remember, Paul had been there a year and a half. He said, aren't you just human beings? What after all is Apollos? And what is Paul? We're just human beings. We're not a religion. We're just people serving. He said literally in verse 5 of 1 Corinthians 3, we are only servants through whom you came to believe because God set it up that way as the Lord assigned to each one his task. But then he said these words, and I love this. He said, I planted the seed and Apollos watered it. How many times do you have to plant a seed for a garden? For a particular plant? One time. The seed is planted once. How many times do you have to water it? In Texas, you water it a lot. In Texas, you water it a lot, especially if it's not raining much. If God's not watering it automatically, you got to water it a lot. And Apollos went to Corinth from the seed that Paul had planted, and he watered them with the washing of the word over and over, daily, 
Because he got to know this word so that he could wash them with the water of the word. And Paul said, I planted the seed, yes. And Paul watered, I mean, Apollos watered it, yes. But he said, we couldn't bring any harvest. The Lord brought the harvest. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. How many people have you saved, preacher? Zero. Zero. Because anybody that's saved because of Paul or Apollos or Michael, anybody that's saved because of Buzz or Terry or any of you out there are going to die and go to hell. They have to put their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ and not a church or a man. And Paul was saying that very clearly. The seed is planted once, but the church needs watering regularly. And the only thing we can water with that's of value, that's of eternal value, is this word. So just in today's verses, as we began this journey, I, I said that, that we don't see a lot of detail about God, but we see God. And here's the most beautiful thing we see about God through the Holy Spirit, through the Son, that He was creator of God. He throughout the Bible, encouraged, directed. He also put into individuals by correcting them to get them on the right path and, and accepting, not necessarily in that order. We are to encourage people. We're to direct them. Sometimes we're to correct them, but we're always to accept them. That's why this mission that the Lord has called our church to, because he's given us an opportunity, and we have a day when this body's not, this building's not being used. The rest of the week it's being used. But on Friday nights, God, what can we use this building for? And he said, why don't you fill it up with people that need Jesus, even if you don't speak their language, because there's people in your congregation that speak their language. So in today's verses, and this is the close, God used Paul to carry the gospel of Christ to towns where no churches had been planted yet, and he planted churches there. God used Gallio to protect Paul from the angry Jews, because God said, I'll protect you, for I have many people in that city. God used Sosthenes. You remember him? He was the one that took the beating for Paul, the one who was that synagogue ruler, and yet later became converted to Jesus Christ and approved Paul, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1 through 3. God used Priscilla and Aquila, two as one. God said, you're not individuals, Priscilla and Aquila. I put you together for a reason. You are a couple, and I need you as a couple. I need you two as one, and that's what it means spiritually for two to become one and for God to use them. Priscilla and Aquila were willing to be used of God, first to give Paul shelter and a job in the first verses of chapter 18, and then to pull up their tent stakes, literally because they were tent makers, and to head out as missionaries with Paul to Ephesus and then to respectfully direct Apollos to the way of the Lord so that Apollos could go and preach and teach and water a town of conservative numbers, say 200,000 people lived in Corinth. The more liberal numbers, which very well may be right, say between half a million to 700,000 people lived in Corinth. Where was it? Priscilla and Aquila? By this time, they're stuck over in little Ephesus. And yet, P Apollos, one that they spoke to and gave the news of Jesus Christ, went to a place and saw tens of thousands, tens of thousands of people be discipled through the Word of God, through Apollos, and the wisdom and the intellect and the tools and the gifts that God gave him. They are, all of those individuals that, that were learned and brought up in discipleship through Apollos were fruit of who? Priscilla and Aquila. They were fruit of Paul. They were the fruit of Sosthenes. They were the fruit of if Gallio accepted Christ, which we don't necessarily have. They were the fruit because all of this was like a web of individuals who worked together. And God used them together. And then God used Apollos, as I said, proving the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah because he knew the Old Testament. Now here's where it gets real for us. God has called me. I, I didn't necessarily realize until this week whenever I was thinking on these things and the Lord was showing me this. God called me to be Apollos to our church. My job is to water it. I wasn't the one who planted the seed. That was Tom Ruane. It was actually the Lord through Tom. But he's planted a seed here because he said, this is the place that's supposed to be here. And by the time God brought me in, when Tom was going to plant another seed, because he was a church planter, he went to Kaufman from here. 
God brought me in like Apollos to water. Now, I don't have the intellect at all that Apollos has. I, I learn and I cram for any given time so I can learn as much as I can know about a particular scripture. But the word of God doesn't return void. And every detail that we can give to it is something that will apply to you, something that will apply to me. So God called me to be like Apollos to water this church. God has called some here to be like Paul to help plant a church because people need Jesus. And this building can be used to win 10 or 1,000 to Christ who I can't even talk to except for in broken Spanish. You see, God can use you like Paul. And some of you need to take a step forward, especially if you can speak Spanish. Because people need Jesus. God has called some to be like Gallio, to stand up for Christians who are persecuted at church, or at school, or at home, or at work. There are individuals who are made fun of at school because they're Christians. And if you walk by them, you're missing the opportunity to be the one who God has called to protect them. Just like because God has given us that responsibility. And God has called all of us, and we need more of you, to be Priscilla and Aquila. I mean, you can be likened to Priscilla and Aquila as an individual, or you can be a couple who is Priscilla and Aquila to commit your home or your business for God's use. Uh, not just to send people out on mission, but be willing to step out of your comfort zone on your own to humbly and privately share truth with me as those things are needed. Because the fact is that God, who is the creator of all, is flowing through individuals just like he did throughout the Bible, and we're seeing today in these individuals, and he still needs us. He still needs individuals. The Bible is a history book of human beings, I told you. And these, these, uh, this history book, these individuals were willing to be used of God or we wouldn't have the gospel today. We have to be willing to be used of God or this area will not receive the gospel as it needs to receive the gospel. We are his hands. We are his feet. And if you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you are outside of the circle. In fact, you will not be in heaven unless you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. He literally died for your sins. He had to die for your sins. One who knew no sin became your sin and became my sin so that our sin could be forgiven so that we could get into a perfect heaven because there is no sin in heaven. Those things had to be washed away and I couldn't do it on my own. They have to be forgiven and they can only be forgiven through Jesus Christ. And Jesus said in John chapter 14 verse 6, he said, I'm the way there. I am the way and I'm the truth and I'm the life and no one is going to get there except through me. He said that. Not by being good, not by any other religion. I saw a cartoon this week on something that, that had a, a whole bunch of tombstones with the names of, of religious leaders and, and, uh, and, and folks that we saw of great knowledge and, and earthly value. But those who had not publicly professed Jesus Christ, and there was tombstones all over there. And then there was a tomb that Jesus had been in and the stone was rolled away. You see, all of those religious leaders are in the ground. And I'm going to be in the ground one day too if the Lord doesn't come back and the trumpet of the Lord sound and us head out of here early. But the fact is, but the one who rose is calling us to a risen life, eternal life, and we're going to rise with him one day just as well. So, are you being used of God? That's it. Are you being used of God? Because you can be. And he needs you. And all we looked at today, that we could have preached this in many different ways, was a group of individuals webbed together for the cause and the work of Jesus Christ so that the gospel would be spread. That's us, okay? I want to do one last thing. I want us to sing the first verse. Maybe with our eyes shut this time, if, or you can look up, or whatever you want to do, to that song, Just As I Am. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb, 
of God I come, I come. Lord, that verse says, though you bid me to come to you, you beg me to come to you. It's in my court to whether I respond or not. You bid us to come to you, and then you wait. Lord, may we not waste another day as individuals, as couples, and as a church. May the prayers of the righteous avail much. May the word of God bear fruit. And may the watering of this planted church bear much fruit for your sake. Whether they speak English, Spanish, whether they're black, white, red, yellow, it doesn't matter, Father. May we bring folks to you so that you can wash them and wash away their sins. That great will be our reunion when we sing back home again in glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you as you go. Beautiful people.